church. Will you sing that flag? Feel that church. Is that all right?
stay with us. We need to hold on to it, y'all. Take it on back out the door with you. Don't come back in. Come go out the way you came in. Come in with the fresh of you. Knowing that God did something for you while you was in the house. God brought you out of some things when you came in the house. God healed that body. Hallelujah. Yes, it's a prayer too. Because he can do that. That's the kind of God we serve. I'm so excited. My toes is tipping. But it's all. That's a good thing. I told Sister Beverly, my toes is tipping, Sister Beverly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when God answers the prayers and, and do things for you, and you be like, well, Lord, I just pray for everybody. supposed to be like that. Be selfish about your own self. Just give it to everybody else. Ask God to bless everybody else. I seem like he just did. He just moving and moving and moving and moving. So I'm good. I ain't gonna stop praying and I know the devil's on my track, but I'm good right now today. <laughs> right now, this hour, I'm good. And that's all right. That's a blessing. That's a blessing and we thank God for everything that he's done. Because truly this is his day. And we just got to enjoy it. I was glad when they said that to me that it's going to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. We give honor to our leader, the angel of the house of the Lord. It's so good to be here. Be in a good place. Hallelujah. Elder Wampa, I ain't even going to do it.
chapter of Saul, of, of Samuel, excuse me. Anybody know the story of how Samuel was a man, anointed king of Israel? And the Bible says when uh, 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 he lost his donkey and he went to go find it, and 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 his servant told him, "Have you considered seeing the seer?" And on the journey, they had spent all of the fourth shekel of silver. And the Bible says when he went to go see the seer, God had already told him. Had already told Samuel that there would be one to anoint King of Israel. And as he went, the Bible says in the first verse that he anointed his head with oil. He kissed him on his face. He says, Is it nothing that I make a captain over my people? But he went to prophesy to Saul. And the Bible says at that, 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 that. When he left there, he told him to send his servant on. And he went and he said, The first group of people that you encounter. He said that, that you lost out of the store back in the two. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. 
God will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So I will sing praises into the name forever that I may daily perform my vows. All right, Brother Tony. That's another one to hold on to, baby. Hallelujah. Perform your vows that you promised God. Hallelujah. For real man. The wind in my
word. Minister to good. Preach God's word. Minister to good. Give us what God gave you. Give a brief history. 
David was the son of Jesse, as we already know, and he was anointed to be king. But before he could be anointed king, he went through a whole lot of trials and tribulations. Saul, who was the first king, and David was going to be the second king, his successor, Saul became very angry and distressed. He was not a very good fighter and warrior like David was, so he became very angry and God had turned his hand against Saul because Saul disobeyed him. And so Saul became so jealous of David, he decided, he plotted several plots. How am I gonna kill this guy? He threw a javelin at him and when his son Jonathan decided that he was going to help David because he made a pledge with David that I'm going to be with you, he said, our souls are knitted together. So whatever, anything that happens, he's going to notify David. And his father was telling him most of the plots that he had against David. So, Saul, so, David, so Jonathan decided to tell him everything that his dad plotted against him. And then David even came up with another, I'm sorry, Saul came up with another plot. He was going to marry his daughter to David because he wanted to pretty much be able to pin David everywhere he was. So he promised him the first daughter. David sent David to war. While David was at war, he gave that daughter to someone else. So when David returned and he was successful, he didn't actually think he would come back. When he returned, he said, I'm going to give you my younger daughter. And so he said, but for you to get that daughter, you have to go back to war, and he put him in the heat of battle. Everyone knows the story of what David did. Okay, so this is something that actually happened to him, and later on, he's going to do the same thing to Uriah. So he, he went to war, and he said, you have to bring me back some of um, the, the, the skin of the male part. I want 100. So in other words, he's have to kill or circumcise 100 men. But David did one better than that. He came back with 200 skins. So he gave him his daughter. Well, is this daughter now, remember he has one game changer, which is Jonathan, this is Saul's son. So now he gives him his daughter. She became a game changer for David. So now she's notifying David also of all of the plots that her father has against him. So it went on for a long time, and I will bore you with all of the details, but for, for, it went on for a while, and then finally, David plotted to kill him, right at his house where he was with his daughter. She told him, and she loaded him out of the window, and she put some sheep hair in the bed. So when they came in, he was gone, and he got away. So fast, 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 fast forward in the story, for 13 years, David is running from this wicked king. How many people know that where God has ordained you or anointed you for something, your enemy is going to chase you? Everybody's not going to be happy for you that you're being elevated by God. Because they think that maybe they should have it, or they think someone else that they like better should have it. But when you are anointed by God, there's nothing that the enemy can do. He can chase you for 13 years. He can catch you, almost catch you, but he never will. You are ordained by God. So hold on to that thought. Anytime that you know you're ordained by God, don't worry about what people say or what people do to you. You are ordained and just hold on to that word. So Saul goes on and he tries to get him he even, the, the position that meant so much to him, which is being king, he abandoned that position to chase David. Now, if that meant so much to him, why are you chasing David? He ran away. But in other words, I want to make sure you're dead. You're not going to be king. So David hid in a cave. While he was in this cave, all these other distressed people showed up in the cave. And everybody had all these different issues. Israel, we know, was in turmoil. And all these commanders and all these misfits showed up at the cave. David now, in turn, starts training them how to be soldiers. Remember, he was an excellent soldier. So now he starts training in his cave. Most of us, when we get in a cave, we get tunnel vision. We start looking in the cave. And we know caves tend to be very dark. 
So where the difference between David and most warriors, David learned how to look outside the cave. As far out as he can see, that's where he looked. So we need to learn how to look outside our cave or our pit, if we're in a pit, instead of looking inside. So I'm going to fast forward and go to this, this a warrior who was a game changer for David, and his name was Benaiah. And Benaiah, he was the commander of what we call the Jebusites and the Sarahites. These were guards for, for David. Now David needed a bodyguard because David was the most wanted man on earth. He was never wanted alive. He was always wanted dead. And when you have an anointing on your life, most of your enemies are not going to want you alive. They want you dead. And so sometimes you have to hide in your pit. But while you're in your pit, that is not a place for a pity party. That is a place to dump off all of your load so you can be channeled and refocus your energies on how I'm going to get out of this pit. And when I get out of this pit, I'm going to focus on what God has for me to do. So this guy, Beniah, most people never heard of Beniah. Beniah came from the tribe of Levites. He came from the tribe of Aaron. So he was anointed to be a priest. He's the only person in the Bible that was a priest and a warrior. So this guy was a special guy, but God had a plan for him because what we know that the world is looking for a hero, but God is looking for a game changer. But eventually Saul dies, and as by promise by God, but not right away, it still took some years, David eventually becomes the king and establish his army using the soldiers that he found in the cave or outside of the cave. Most of them were foreigners, and he trained them. David was a game changer who in turn, he needed a game changer. Have you ever seen a bodyguard that needed a bodyguard? But David was a game changer that needed some game changers. And God was lining up his game changers all along the way, right in the king's family who was trying to kill him. David had 37 mighty men, and they were all called warriors. Many of them were single-handedly killing a whole bunch of people. One killed about 800. But he had this elite group that was called the Three. They were leaders of the armed forces of Israel. And these three people, that was their name, the Three. And so if one died or one retired or had an ailment, they were just replaced. But they were always called the three, and that's what it was. Then he had another group that's called the 30. Well, Beniah became the commander of the group of the 30. He never made it to the three, but he made it to the 30. Beniah's name means God builds up. He came from a place called Jebusil, and Jebusil means God is building you up for a better place. He's building you up for a better place. So God is a builder. So no matter what your issues are or your calling is, he builds us. Sometimes we try to jump ahead of what God calls us to do. You know, pastor asked us to clean the floor. We don't want to do that. We want to be a prayer warrior. Or we want to preach. Because, you know, the floor is, you know, that's not good enough. But we have to remember that in order for God to trust us, he has to build us. So it's not a terrible thing to start off on the floor or start off in whatever you have to do. Do what God asks you to do because he's building you. And so we're, uh, we're, talk, we're talking about these are game changers. Now, Benaiah, he was a very great officer. And as I said, his name means Bill. Bill. He came from Capazil, meaning God has gathered and grabbed. Gathered and grabbed. So one of the most significant things about Benaiah, he came from the southernmost city of Israel, right on the border of Israel. He was the son of Jehoiada, which was a priest. He was a high priest, with descendant of Aaron. He also was a man of valor and had unusual strength. In Daniel 11.32 says, The people that intimately know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Benaiah served as the third army commander in the third month of the year for 2,400 troops. God is slowly building him. 
He was in charge of David's bodyguards, and also there were 30 of them. He had three great events that he was known for in the Bible. And those three events had some significance. He chased the lion into a pit on a snowy day, and he defeated the lion, he killed the lion. Now most people would wonder, what is the significance? Why would he chase a lion into the pit? We know what the lion represents. The lion represents strength. Yeah. And it represents, because he's chasing this um, lion in the pit, this lion is an enemy of him. Who do we know that's known to be a lion? Like a roaring lion walking to and fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. So that's the reason why he had to chase him in the pit to get him. And it was a snowy day, so Benaiah was known to be a man that had unusual circumstances. He had the worst enemies, and I was always caught during the worst times, during the worst circumstances. Now you're chasing a, a lion. A lion is known to be 500 pounds. He can leap about 35 feet in the air. He can run 35 miles an hour. And he, one slap with his paw will break your, 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 um, your cranium. And so why would he chase this lion in the pit? There was also some more significance to it. And I'll get back with that. Another thing he did, Benaiah killed an Egyptian man about the same height as Goliath, which is what David did. He was almost nine feet tall. Using the Egyptian spear, he snatched it out of his hand and he killed him with his own weapon. He killed two Ariels. This is another thing that he did, which were men of Moab's. Someone is probably saying, great story, but how does this pertain to me? Well, Paul says in Romans 15 and 4, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Therefore, these occurrences in the Bible are not just for entertainment. Instead, they serve a true purpose. And so I'll get right to it. Benaiah killed two Moabites. As described in Genesis 19, we recall a story that Lot and his two daughters fled with their father from Sodom and Gomorrah, and they ended up in a cave. While in the cave, the older daughter convinced the younger daughter to have relations with their father. They thought they would never get out of the cave, and so they decided, well, we're gonna have, we need to have children. So while their father was in a drunken stupor, they laid with their father. Well, that's the beginning of some of their sorrows. So they had, they had these two boys, each of had a boy. One was named Ammon, for which, from which the Amorites came from. And the other one, his name was Moab. This is where the Moab Moabites come from. So this was a tribe, and this, this was a tribe living on the border, and now we have two half-brothers who have this massive kingdom. They were closely related to the Israelites and grew up right beside them. However, they were always enemies to Israel, even though they were related. This relationship is symbolic because of what they did with their father they're living beside their family members right on the border. This represents an enemy that's within us to which we are related. In the New Testament, this enemy is called the flesh. Some people call it the old man, and some people say it's my old life. But it never goes away because it dwells in you and it dwells right beside you. You have created family with that flesh. Benaiah slew an Egyptian, that's another thing that he did. And this, remember, in Egypt back in those days, that was the leading nation. It was considered the world power. Because of the large armies, the huge temples, the pharaohs, and all of its impressiveness. This is why if the Israelites longed to return to Egypt, even after God took them out and was taking them to the promised land. This victory symbolized the overcoming of the world. Egypt represents the world. Now the final point is the slaying of the lion in the pit. Our adversary the devil is prowling all around seeking whom he may devour. This is an enemy who has the characteristics of a lion, but he's not a lion, he's like a lion. He's a phony. The true lion we know is the lion of the tribe of the Judah. What a wonder he is. He has as much, he has as much power, this like a lion, 
only as much power as we give to him. Each of us has felt the pressure of these three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. In spite of all the trials and tribulations, David managed to live to age 70 because he had game changers and they chased the enemies in the pit. In 1 Kings, in, it's, in, in 1 Kings it says, Solomon inherited the throne after Absalom, Abjaniah, Ab which is David's other son, Joab, which is David's commander, they all had to be killed in order for Solomon to inherit the throne from his father who was dying. In my conclusion, the world says, don't hate the player, just hate the game. But now God doesn't want us to hate the player. He doesn't want us to hate the game. Instead, he's looking for people to change while we're in the game. God notices his people even when others don't notice us. Don't be so weary in well doing. If someone doesn't notice you, maybe they're going through something in their life. Tell them and say, hey, how are you doing? If they ignore you, then it's okay anyway. Remember that God has noticed you. He has you right in the palm of your hand. In the book of Isaiah, he says, I have your name written in the palm of my hand. So he's constantly watching you. He's constantly watching you because you're right in the palm of his hand. Don't worry if somebody ignores you. It may hurt your feelings, but focus on the mission. Chase your enemy in the pit. The reason why it's important to chase your enemy in the pit, that's a good burying place for your enemy. Once you get them in the pit, you kill them there, and you leave them in the pit, throw some dirt, and keep moving. Now, we're not going to business of going around killing people. We're talking about killing the attitudes. Some of us have attitudes. All of us have some type of attitude that's not pleasing to God. And it's not even pleasing sometimes to our pastor and our co-pastors. We're going to ask for forgiveness today because God is looking for game changers. Not everyone is on board with your elevation, but it's okay. Such is the case was the case with Joseph, who was thrown into a pit by his own brothers, who didn't agree with his dreams. And he had to run, Saul, I'm sorry, David had to run from his master Saul for seven years. Ultimately, Jesus was rejected by the people and by his own disciples. God chooses us based on our hearts. It is, it is through our hearts that we connect with God. David said, create in me a clean heart. He said that he didn't say create me clean feet. He didn't say free, clean, 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 clean hair. He said create in me a clean heart because the heart is what connects to God. A hero is hyped up by the world, but a game changer is built up by God. The pit, the cave, and the cross are perfect places for game changers. David was in the cave when he should be in the palace. But now he was in the pit when he should be a military commander. Jesus was on the cross when he should have been wearing his crown. Forgiveness, forgiveness is all about going up on the cross and setting your enemies free. And you plead guilty on that cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He knew that if he endured that suffering, then he will reign forever with his father. Yeah. While you're in your, pay, your cave or pit, what is your attitude all about? Are you sitting there angry, plotting revenge on your enemies? Or are you ministering to all of the rejects and the misfits that are out there, such as what, such as what he did? That is what God is asking for us to do. He doesn't want us to be bitter and angry. We have emotions. We're going to feel them. But he wants us to get past that. And remember, get your attitudes and leave them in the pit. Are you, are you in the pit complaining about those who have done you wrong? Are you, working on your, are, you, or are you working on your next promotion that God did not assign to you? It is time to build your army just like, uh, just like David did for the final battle. A battle for your soul and the soul of others that you can hear one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant, and not here depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Get your work done while you're in the cave or the pit. Don't sit around and cry. Don't come to me or don't go to Sister Jane and cry about it. Get up! Shake yourself off and shake off that spirit of depression. God is counting on you and I to battle to go into the battle and 
leave all of your heartaches and your pains behind right there in the pit. Go build your army like David did. In 1 Peter 5 says, Satan is like a roaring lion walking to and fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. However, in Revelation 5 and 5 tell us, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, he has conquered the world. It's already done, my brothers and sisters. All you have to do, all you have to do is remember, just leave your case in the pit. Remember, Jesus was the ultimate game changer who came just so we can have life and life more abundantly. The shedding of the blood was a sufficient sacrifice. What the world wants a hero, but God is looking for a game changer. Leave it in the pit. Thank you.